Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, on behalf of Manila House, I'm Bambina Olivares, and I handle all the members' programming um, for, for the club. Um, today, we are talking about uh, preventing the next pandemic, uh, basically examining the relationship of the wildlife trade and disease. Um, and we have with us today um, two panelists, Stephen Galster from Freeland Organization and um, Paolo Pagaduan from World Wildlife Fund. I think there has been some speculation about the origins of the novel coronavirus being manufactured possibly in, in a lab, in a, like as a, as a method of warfare, bio-warfare. But I think that scientific investigation has revealed that um, corona um, that is probably transmitted by an animal. Um, so coronaviruses are zoonotic, meaning they're transmitted between animals and peoples and people. For example, detailed investigations found that the SARS um, coronavirus was transmitted from civet cats to humans and the MERS coronavirus from drom dromedary camels to humans. Several known coronaviruses are circulating in animals that have not yet infected humans. So this is a possibility in the future. I mean, this is not going to be the last pandemic outbreak that we're going to see. Or hopefully it, it'll be the last in our lifetime, but all the evidence points to that not being the case. Um, several of the early cases of the coronavirus outbreak were traced to the Hunan, Huanan Seafood Wholesale Market in Wuhan, where exotic animals are for sale, either for meat, Chinese medicine <laughs> preparations, or as pets, or, and, and they are kept in shockingly unsanitary conditions and naturally close to each other. The virus that caused the outbreak is known as SARS-CoV-2, a newly discovered virus closely related to bat coronaviruses pangolin coronaviruses and um, SARS, the original SARS um, coronavirus. Um, so I'm going to introduce you now to our first speaker, Stephen Galster. Stephen is an environmental and human rights investigator and counter trafficking program designer. Since 1987, he has planned and participated in investigations and remedial programs to stop wildlife trafficking, human trafficking and corruption, and to build good governance in Asia, Africa, Russia and the USA. He co-founded several civil society organizations, including Global Survival Network, Phoenix, Wild Aid, and Freeland. He currently serves as director of Freeland, a counter-trafficking group. He has been featured on CNN, National Geographic, Discovery, and Time Magazine, and the New York Times. Our next speaker is Paolo Pagaduan, a conservationist with 20 years of experience organizing communities towards sustainable development through participatory approaches, managing projects on ridge to reef management, promoting cross-sector collaborations from the barrios to the boardrooms, working with grassroots government agencies and private corporations to work together to live in harmony with nature. He also serves as executive director of the Center for Philippine Biodiversity Journalism, in addition to being project manager for World Wildlife Fund Philippines, currently focused on the Forest for Water project. Now I will turn you over to Stephen, who's going to speak about the wildlife trade in general and um, its impact on disease. Stephen? Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for having me here today. You can hear me okay? <clears throat> okay, great. So I'm, uh, I'm speaking to you from Bangkok right now, um, representing Freeland, but I'm also representing uh, an allied campaign that Freeland belongs to. We're an equal member to a, a, a global allied campaign called uh, End Pandemics. You can find it on a website uh, called endpandemics.earth. And basically it's um, almost 30 organizations so far from around the world that decided to come together about 12 weeks ago uh, in the wake of COVID-19, all realizing we had a a similar goal, which was to prevent the next pandemic from ever hitting us again, which is why we called it End Pandemics. So it's, a, it's an alliance of groups like ours. Um, we work on wildlife and human rights. We're an NGO, but there's also, um, there's groups that are experts in um, health, uh, science, technology. There's a few businesses involved. Uh, we've got climate change, wildlife, so we've all come together from different thematic and geographic uh, backgrounds to try to put a global campaign together to wake the world up and especially world leaders. And um, 
intergovernmental organizations to put <clears throat> nature conservation front and center, not just to make the world look greener and, and beautiful, but to protect people as well. So I'm gonna just run through a, a quick presentation uh, and show you, you know, what we believe in and what we're campaigning for. I will share my screen here. And it worked a moment ago. Okay, here we go. Good. Okay, we're on, right? Okay, uh, it, you can see us okay, right, Bamita? Yes, perfectly. Okay, Thank great. You. Yeah. Okay, so um, my background's actually, uh, before I worked in an NGO like this, I actually worked on national security issues and I've come to realize, I mean, COVID-19 really was a bomb. You know, it went off in one country, but it affected all of us. Um, <clears throat> you know, I know we're over six, uh, over, around five or 600,000 deaths already. Uh, we really got, got off lucky this time. But if you look at the stats, basically there's been no other uh, worse impact from another even natural disaster or terrorist act in the last century. And the last time that we really got hit this hard was much harder was, you know, over a hundred years ago with the Spanish flu, which did not start, start in Spain as we know, but got that name because uh, there was just more open press at the time from Spain. So everybody thought it was coming from there, <clears throat> but that affected one third of the world's population and it killed up to 50 million people. This is what zoonotic outbreaks can do. And we really got lucky this time, even though we're still going through it, uh, COVID-19 was light compared to what can still happen. Now, you know, people are still talking, as you said in the beginning about where did this come from? You know, was it a bat in a lab or was it from a pangolin? Or was it, you know, as some people are suggesting, uh, a combination of the two. Um, and I think that that's not as important as what all scientists are agreeing to. All the, uh, the, the good scientists who worked on infectious diseases, zoonotic outbreaks, they're all saying the same thing really, which is that um, this outbreak, COVID-19, jumped from a wild animal to a person, just like they have before with mares, with SARS, bird flu, Ebola, HIV, all of these jump from a wild animal to a person, sometimes directly, sometimes through a domestic animal. And the two big reasons that, um, that this is happening <clears throat> more and more and why these outbreaks are getting stronger are first the rising trade, rising commercial trade in wild animals and the second reason is destruction of wild habitat, which is often done for agricultural purposes and a lot of times for intensive uh, industrial agricultural uh, setups. So essentially we're seeing animals, wild animals, pushed out of or pulled out of their natural environments, brought into closer contact with people in unnatural ways, and it just takes one of those animals to be carrying a pathogen for which we have no immune response and bang, uh, a disease has been transmitted and we can transmit it to, to each other. Now, the world is still hyper-focused on finding a cure for this. We hear about it in the news every single day. Has anybody found a vaccine yet? Spending a lot of money and a lot of time looking for you know, the, the vaccine for, for COVID-19. And of course, we're seeing governments um, write uh, stimulus checks and recovery packages to help out individuals and businesses, um, which is understandable. Everybody, if you haven't gotten sick or died from this, I think everybody can at least relate to the economic impact. You know, it's been in the trillions and trillions of dollars. But, uh, you know, if we look at the fact that these diseases, that this, the zoonotic outbreak jumped from uh, wild animals and that the, the purpose, the reason that happened was wildlife trade and destruction of wild habitat. What we're seeing really 
are governments, you know, applying very expensive band-aids that are going to need frequent changing. You know, the, the vaccine that they're going to come up with will not necessarily or probably even work against the next outbreak. Otherwise, we would have been using the vaccine that was um, used for the last COVID, COVID-02, which was SARS. Each strain of virus is different. So we're spending a lot of time and money on something that we're going to have to just redo uh, once the next outbreak comes. Let's take a look for a minute at the region. I know we're talking largely about the Philippines today, but it's important since this is a, a pandemic and globally and regionally, how has the region done um, you know, with COVID-19 and its response, particularly with respect to, to wildlife trade? Wildlife trade is you know, upwards of 20 billion plus a year, and that's just for what they call CITES listed species. Some people put it at 10 times that amount if you take a look at all animals. Um, China, of course, has been a big focus. China is probably the number one consumer and importer of wildlife in the world. Uh, Vietnam being right next to it has been an enormous um, transit country. These are Vietnamese enforcement officers with their hands on pangolins. These are frozen pangolins that would have been smuggled in from Indonesia in a, a really big shipment. Pretty typical. Uh, most of this in transit to China. Vietnam has responded very well to COVID-19, had some of the lowest uh, sickness and death uh, cases in the world. And their prime minister right away talked about um, closing the wildlife trade after watching what, what China did. China wildlife trade is estimated to be between 72 and $78 billion a year. So their first reaction was to close the markets and even make consumption of wildlife illegal, which should tell us something. Now there's a battle going on, which we can talk about during the Q&A on whether they're going to make that permanent and, and far stretching. Same thing in China, a lot of money being uh, in Vietnam, rather, a lot of money being made there. So it'll be interesting to see if they, they relax it again. Uh, Singapore, not a huge market, but a big transit uh, for wildlife because of their free market, um, free trade zones. This is a picture of pangolin scales. Uh, pangolins are also coming from Africa. We still don't know, you know, if it came from a pangolin in uh, Wuhan, if COVID-19 was transmitted there, whether it was a pangolin from, say, Palawan or from other parts of Asia or, or from uh, Africa for that matter. Probably it was from uh, an Asian pangolin because largely the pangolin products, you're looking at the remains of 18,000 dead animals there put into potato sacks. These are scales that are made for medicine. But um, these would have been on their way through Southeast Asia, probably through Vietnam and into China. Myanmar, uh, Northern Myanmar has markets that look like this, close to the Chinese border. People would have been coming across as tourists to buy whatever they wanted. Uh, Myanmar just recently announced that they want to legalize and open up uh, pangolin uh, farming and tiger farming for commercial purposes. Indonesia, uh, some of the biggest markets in the world for live and dead bats. You can buy them outside, you can buy them even at grocery stores in some parts of the country, still selling them. Philippines, uh, we did a report, you see the cover on the right side there. Uh, we have a data fusion center that took a look at the dynamics of trade in the region. And one of the things we found is that the legal trade in wildlife mass a huge illegal trade. You know, it's a lot of this trade is done right in plain sight, uh, masked as documented trade. Philippines, we find, is, is largely a, a source country, a target. Of course, there's trade everywhere. And just to give you an idea, uh, what we also found is that the trafficking of species from and through the Philippines is often tied up with other forms of transnational organized crime. This is a snapshot, open source snapshot from a, what they call a MARSEC report or Marine Security. They do these uh, every couple of weeks. This is from February of last year. If you look around just real quickly, you'll see incidents of people capsizing, getting killed, uh, trafficking cigarettes and guns, um, altercations, etc. There's all kinds of things happening uh, on the waters that we don't always hear about. 
And if you look at another geographic section also associated with the Philippines, take a closer look there, you'll see uh, seizures of, you know, in this case, over a, a ton of ketamine, you know, coming into Taiwan, but also 4,000 pangolins. You got shark fin, you got all kinds of things happening. So there's so much wildlife trafficking going on on the, on the high seas as well. And then we see indicators in other countries when this wildlife is seized, like in Vietnam in this picture, which was taken by ENV Vietnam, a great organization that supports enforcement there, appeared in an article in National Geographic also. You're seeing several hundred sea turtles there that were poached from the waters around the Philippines, uh, put onto a vessel, moved up to Vietnam where it was being processed and probably sold onto China. Um, now I'm an American and I'm not pointing the finger at Asia and we certainly don't need the rest of the world thinking this is an Asian problem because it's not, it's a global problem. And what I'm talking about there is wildlife trade. The United States is in fact the second biggest importer or consumer of wildlife in the world. So we in a, as an organization and our alliance are also campaigning for the United States to uh, close their markets in, um, in commercial markets and, and wild animals. Uh, I'm also showing this picture because as well intentioned as these protesters are here, they, they put up wet markets on their uh, banner. It's very important to know that our campaign, and I don't think anybody's campaign should be about closing wet markets. Wet markets are basically outdoor supermarkets. Um, some wet markets will have wild animals for sale, like that particular one in Wuhan did. But for the most part, they're selling fresh vegetables, other kinds of meats. They may have wild animals, but uh, most of them don't. Uh, I think we need to also just quickly take a look at the lesson from SARS, which was the last COVID. That was 2002, 2003. Not as many people died, not as many people got sick, but it was kind of scary. Uh, China at first closed their wildlife markets and they they disposed of a, a lot of animals, which is probably not the right thing to do. This time, they closed their wild animal markets, made consumption illegal. Like I said, they're still talking about um, maybe reopening some. What most governments are doing now, and what United Nations uh, groups are doing, what the United Nations Environment Program, Convention on Biodiversity, and we're talking at the very top level, they're basically saying, uh, let's close down high-risk markets, let's close down illegal wildlife trade, but let's not shut down all wildlife trade because wildlife trade also puts money in poor people's pockets. We need to take care of their livelihoods and not just, you know, do a broad sweeping thing. That's what China did after SARS. They compromised, they went into their markets, they regulated them more, they cleaned them up, and we still got COVID-19. And the reason for this is because these viruses don't discriminate between legal and illegal animals. You know, it just takes one animal bringing a pathogen in for which we have no immune response and boom, something like this can take off. And we have to remember what we saw in Wuhan. I mean, a bomb in one city, doesn't matter where it is, New York, Manila, uh, anywhere in the world, it just takes one person <laughs> catching it, coughing on the other person or whatever, getting on a plane, and we're in just such an interconnected world now, these things can happen much faster and spread faster than they did before. And we're still dealing with COVID, of course. So essentially, we really just need to step back and change our relationship with nature. And, and what do I mean by that? A one health approach, and this is what I think a lot of the organizations, including the ones I just mentioned, do agree on, which is we need a policy, we need a strategy by which governments are protecting people, wildlife, and the environment all at the same time. And the good news is that there are strategies to do this. It does mean governments spending their budgets differently and spending more money on nature protection and, and, and stopping um, siloed or stovepiped approaches toward protection. It's, it's merging strategies. So more specifically, what are we talking about? How do you do this? 
Well, in our view, first thing is ban commercial trade in wild animals, okay? We are not talking about banning subsistence hunting or subsistence fishing, anything like that. We're talking about banning the commercial trade in wild animals, which for the most part is for status, medicines, exotic foods, things that we don't really need. It's just adding money to somebody's bank account. But any of these animals could be viral bombs when you take them out of nature. Also, uh, putting together multi-agency task forces. Too often, this kind of issue is dealt with or put on the table of, say, a Ministry of Environment or a Wildlife Department, who are trying their best with very small budgets and, and, and teams to control illegal trade, much less you know, legal trade, which is masking a lot of smuggling. This, was, this is an international security and national security issue. We need police, we need national security, you need public health, you need all the agencies involved to carry out that one health approach and make sure this kind of bomb doesn't go off again. <clears throat> we also need to see there are going to be legal wildlife dealers who've been in the business for a while, who if you do a ban on commercial trade in wild animals are gonna say, hey, that's not fair to me. Um, and fair enough, I think these <clears throat> recovery and stimulus packages should include a small, small, small percentage of what they're giving out that will go a long way in compensating these dealers to help them transition into another line of business. I mean, you know, the slave trade made a lot of people money too along the supply chain. We made a tough decision at one point in history to ban that, and I think this is uh, on the same level. Secondly, uh, you need, all this trade is cross-border, <clears throat> so you need cooperation as well. Historically, uh, the Southeast Asia had a wildlife enforcement network called ASEAN WEN. <clears throat> Philippines is a member. Technically, it's still going on, but it is pretty weak. When the donors stepped out, it, it hasn't really done a lot. Each country was asked to put like $15,000 on the table to fund a secretariat, <clears throat> and it just wasn't very high priority at the time. I think now it is, and this structure still exists. The Philippines, when they chaired it, they were a strong chair. We just need to see the countries come back together and put, in addition to the environmental agencies, the security ones too, to make sure that this trade is stopped at the borders as well. <clears throat> Um, one of the things people are going to ask is how are we going to pay for all this? You know, all this enforcement, um, pushing money over into nature protection. Well, part of it is just making a tough decision and moving money uh, from, say, defense or getting defense more involved in nature protection. The money's there, but thankfully, uh, there's also legislation that allows governments to pick the pockets of the wildlife traffickers. The illegal dealers have made billions and billions. I said at the beginning, you know, 20 billion plus a year, where's all that money? There's cash, there's assets, et cetera. Each government in the world has an anti-money laundering authority. The Philippines is one of the few countries in the region that has laws on the books that allow for the government to <clears throat> track down, <clears throat> seize and reprogram those assets and they can reprogram them toward uh, nature recovery. So I think, um, you know, I'll leave it off here with the Philippines. I think the Philippines is one of the few countries in the region that has really kind of stuck up for their wildlife against some other superpowers, um, which we don't see uh, as much perhaps from some other countries. Uh, now that China is changing its policy, I think this is a good time for the Philippines to also stand up for their wildlife, close down commercial wildlife trade, ship some of their resources, and um, I would also just at the end here, like to just play, give me one second. I'm going to uh, play a one minute video that represents our campaign. We knew it was coming. The signs were all there. We knew we had to change. 
but we didn't. Destroying wild habitats, exploiting wildlife, turning a blind eye. Maybe it would go away. It didn't. It began to bite back. Primates at HIV, civets at SARS, bats and Ebola. COVID-19 is not the first pandemic, and it won't be the last, unless we deal with the root causes. It's time to stop the wildlife trade and to support compassionate, sustainable farming to protect our planet. Let's change our relationship with nature forever, for all life on Earth. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Hang on, have you? I've concluded, texted? yes. Okay. Oops, sorry. And you gotta close your windows. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Stephen. And now um, Paolo is going to, on behalf of World Wildlife Fund Philippines, um, I think he'll give a greater um, Philippine perspective to the whole issue and um, related to the environment as well. So, Paolo? Okay. Mark, good afternoon. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much for the invitation for this talk. And uh, this will be a bit more focused on the loss of nature and rise of the pandemics compared to Stephen's talk about the illegal wildlife trade. I'll be touching on that a bit, but I'll be focusing more on the environment side. So this has been on the news for quite some time. Uh, since December of 2019, this has dominated the news. It's a virus called the SARS-CoV-2 or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. SARS because it's very similar to the 2003 SARS virus that Stephen mentioned earlier, and, and two because it's the second version of that uh, that we have discovered so far. And this virus leads to a disease called COVID-19. Uh, first detected in December of 2019, it has begun to spread to practically the whole world. The third, a few, uh, when I started making this presentation, it was just at 17,000, but now, today it's actually at 13 million, rather from 7 million to 13 million in just a month. So that is the extent of the infection that this virus has started worldwide. So we've been hearing about zoonosis. So what is zoonosis? Essentially, it's, it comes from the word zoon, in a Greek word zoon for animal and nosos for sickness or disease. So it's essentially an animal disease, animal sickness, caused by microorganisms like bacteria, um, prions or abnormal proteins, think of mad cell disease, and fungi, a mad cow disease rather, fungi and viruses. These viruses have been present uh, in a lot of wildlife, but over the years, over the millennia, they've developed resistances to these viruses so that they no longer harm the host or the animal. But sometimes in a phenomenon called spillover, these viruses can then be transferred to humans. But usually these viruses don't affect us negative, in a negative way because the viruses cannot cope with the new environment. But sometimes when the viruses spill over to some other species, and with that spillover phenomenon, it can morph or mutate into something that eventually becomes pathogenic or can then harm humans. And this is the case for the COVID-19. It's estimated that three out of four infections, uh, three out of four new infectious diseases are coming from animals. It may have been, 
it may seem new, but they've been in the headlines for the past 60 years. These animal these animals to human spillovers are on the rise, and the disease they cause disproportionately affect the more vulnerable people. And currently, there are more than 200 zoonotic diseases. So, how did we get here? What gave rise to this pandemic? So, I will be telling the story about the pathways to the epidemic. And first of all, it's largely because of deforestation. Whenever we cut trees, whenever we convert land, forest lands into, let's say, uh, farms in the Philippines, we convert a lot of them into subdivisions or malls. This, this, the, this harms the, this, is, this becomes a pathway for the pandemic, for the epidemic, when one, we destroy the houses of the habitat of these wildlife, which then makes them more prone to move to other locations which is usually closer to where we live. And second, because the people going to the forest to cut the trees, they then get exposed to the, to the viruses in the, host, the wildlife inside the forest. This is a, a very alarming trend because we have a lot of deforestation in the worldwide. In the Philippines, we may, recover, we may be recovering some of our trees due to some government programs. But still, a lot of our forest lands are being converted to other land uses. Second is species collecting and trafficking. Sometimes you don't have to cut the trees. You just intentionally go into a forest and try to catch and, uh, specific wildlife, like in this case, a bat or maybe a pangolin, or even the civet, civet or alamid for our coffee. And because we come in close contact with these uh, wildlife, there's a greater chance for the viruses that are inherently in, living in, the, in them to spill over to humans. Also, because of the animal markets shown by Stephen in his presentation earlier, our direct contact to their saliva, their wastes, their sweat, and other secretions can also lead to us get transferring the, the viruses from them to us. So essentially, when we come in close contact with wildlife. When, I, when we say wildlife, these are not the pets. These are not the domestic animals. These are the animals that we don't usually uh, come in contact with, the more exotic uh, animals that have been carrying these diseases, for, the viruses for so long, which may also spread from one animal to another, and then eventually it spreads to us and become pathogenic, which may lead to an epidemic. The way we look at it is that the chances of pathogens like viruses passing from the wild and domestic animals to humans may be increased by the destruction and modification of natural ecosystems and the illegal or uncontrolled trade of wild species and the unhygienic conditions under which wild and domestic species are mixed and marketed. Tropical forests are home to millions of species, including viruses. Most are benevolent and cannot live outside their host, but some can quickly mutate and adapt to new conditions and harm the host. The loss of habitats, the modification of natural environment, and more generally, the decline of biodiversity are all factors in the spreading of the emerging infectious diseases. We need a better understanding of how our ecosystems... Yeah. Sorry. We need a better understanding of how our ecosystem functions, and in particular, their role in defending us from the spread of disease. In the, in the meantime, protecting and restoring natural ecosystems is crucial for avoiding unknown risks to our health. As mentioned by Stephen earlier, the One Health approach is seen as one of the best options to, to address the issue. It looks at the health of the environment, it looks at the health of humans, as well as the health of animals or wildlife. This is, when I say One Health, this is more or less an encompassing term which comes, puts, uh, pulls in the, one, the planet health, the eco health approach into one sort of umbrella. And this, this, was, this is essentially the framework that is seen as the most plausible in trying to combat the coming pandemic. So what, we, what do we need to do? 
we need a new deal for nature and people to restore humanity's relationship with nature. We should look at this as an opportunity for state-driven policies and regulations to better regulate land and land use change with faced with significant challenges with the environment. In the Philippines, we still do not have a land use plan, a national land use plan, which is seen by many as a, as a, as a vehicle to help stop these land conversions, which would eventually stop the spread of diseases. We have a lot of laws in the Philippines, but wildlife trafficking laws and uh, land conversion and protection of our environment. But we suffer greatly from implementation and monitoring. So the path, of, the path forward in restoring humanity's relationship with nature, there are immediate steps to stop. The first one is to stop high risk stop illegal, unregulated, and high-risk wildlife trade, as mentioned by Stephen earlier. The second recommendation is that we need to support sustainable food systems that halt encroachment on nature. We've been seeing a lot of development, not just in the Philippines, where we've been converting a lot of our forests into either agriculture lands or subdivisions or even inter... Uh, converting them into other tree forests for, let's say, uh, palm oil or other uh, high-value crop, which tend to aggravate the problem where the species tend to mix together and then eventually come into contact with humans, increasing the risk of them becoming pathogenic and causing another pandemic. The third recommendation is that we need to build a more sustainable relationship between people and nature through sustainable and just economic recovery approaches with defined and holistic goals. Remember, uh, one thing Stephen mentioned earlier that I really liked was that we're not going against the subsistence wildlife uh, hunting because uh, the, a lot of the, of the poor communities depend on some of these wildlife as their source of protein. I've been working in the Ipo watershed in, here in the Philippines for quite a while, and I know that the locals there, the, the indigenous people, do hunt bats and other wildlife in the area. But this is not necessarily for trade. So there's a, a smaller risk of that infection spreading to, huma, to, uh, other, to greater community populations. So... We need to better look at things in a, a more holistic fashion. A lot of people don't realize that when we talk of nature, we're actually talking about the, the source of practically everything we need. When, when we talk to people in Metro Manila about nature, most of them just say clean and green. That's the limit of how they understand nature and that they don't really see it as the source of our food our water, our air, and it provides us with practically everything we need. Yet, we tend to overlook these aspects because we just want to see something clean and green and maybe blue. We don't look at it as, the, as nature being the source of everything for, about our well-being. This horseshoe crab may actually hold the key to our future in, our, in solving this crisis. Because the horseshoe crab is the source of a, a chemical known as LAL, which is very important in the production of vaccine. So if we start losing this species, we may end up without having a cure for the COVID, uh, for the SARS-CoV-2 and other future pandemics. So essentially, when we say protect nature, when, what we're actually saying is that we should protect us. It's not about the panda is cute, the butanding is cute, or even the, the trees are cute. We're just tree huggers. But the reason we do that is because nature is for us. So we need to look at it 
at the perspective of that uh, a healthy planet is the foundation of our own health and well-being. So let's keep our distance, stay at home, and so we can begin be together again. Thank you. Thanks so much, Paolo. Um, thanks for that presentation. I think we can take some questions now. Um, I think uh, you can just type in your questions in the Q&A box or in the chat, and I'll read them out for you. Um, I have one question here about um, from Jonathan Mayuga. CITES, CITES, which is, um, CITES kind of regulates the wildlife trade, right? Um, CITES allows trade in wildlife, thereby legalizing the trade of certain species that are not threatened with extinction. Many countries adhere to CITES being signatories to this international treaty. What do you believe needs to be done to ban the strict, to strictly ban the legal wild, wildlife trade? It's, but I guess you have to make a distinction between legal and illegal, right? Would you like to take that, um, Stephen, or? Sure. Paul? Yeah, I'll, I, I can take that first anyway. Uh, I think CITES, which is the UN body that regulates wildlife trade, or most of it throughout the world, most countries are signatories. Uh, I think CITES needs to be transformed. CITES is a trade treaty. It's not a protection treaty. And just as their previous secretary general uh, is saying throughout other webinars, his concern has been that CITES really never took into account the health hazards from even legal trade. So CITES really needs to stand back and rethink uh, its role. And we just think that actually the safest thing to do uh, is to just ban commercial trade in wild animals, not just the illegal trade, um, you know, the, the legal trade, mass and illegal trade, plus the legal animals can bring a pathogen. I live in Thailand, there were zebras that were brought into the country just this last year, legally. Documentation, the whole bit, went through the process and they brought with them some kind of African horsefly, jumped to regular horses here, and in a pretty quick period of time, killed like 600 of them. Uh, that's a pandemic also, and then I mean, there's, there's supposedly 1.6 million viruses out there in nature ready to be unleashed if we poke with nature the wrong way, half of which supposedly can do the same damage or more than COVID-19 just did. So I think given the fact that it's a really small percentage of people in the world who are benefiting from wildlife trade uh, and a huge number who just got impacted by it, I mean, the amount of money that we're losing, the amount of lives we're losing or could potentially lose, people getting sick, we just really messed up our world. I just really think we need to rethink it. And I think CITES should become a protection treaty, not a trade one. Thank you. Also, uh, I'd like to add something to that, to Jonathan's question. That it's because CITES is, uh, is based on a lot of scientific evidence to to, to, to declare something as endangered, for example. We, without the study, we can't declare anything as endangered and put it on that list. For example, uh, sharks. Most sharks are not there. Fortunately, there are some countries with, that do have laws specifically for these other species that are not on the CITES list. So I think recently uh, it was in Cebu that they banned some of sharks and manta rays from trade and capture and trade. And we also protect the other species like uh, the whale shark in the Philippines, which is not, well, which wasn't part of the sun because uh, it has to be based on scientific research. And some of the species are very hard to, uh, to study. Imagine how many sharks you need to study in order to develop a database for a shark becoming an endanger endangered. So that's something that we also have to work on. We have to put a lot of emphasis on scientific research as well to become better at determining which species are very uh, much in danger of being extinct. And then later on, improve the CITES 
as to what Stephen has said earlier. Um, I wanted to ask, is there any way you can change the habits? I mean, we keep hearing about uh, people who like to eat wildlife. Like it's just kind of like some, it's positioned as some kind of gastronomic experience. How do you change those attitudes? I think there's been a successful campaign more or less about the shark's fin soup. Mm -hmm. um, but how, I mean, and you say, would, would the biggest market be China, the Chinese or something? How, how do you, how do you stop it? There are all these diseases coming up already, but still people are, you know, it hasn't stopped the trade or, or the, or the taste. Well, I think um, there's been a lot of campaigns, as I'm sure my colleague from WWF can attest to as well, uh, around the world, behavior change campaigns, as we call them, to try to get people to think twice or not to buy uh, wildlife. And I worked on one about shark fin soup, as you mentioned, and we tried like the Dickens to get people to stop eating shark fin soup. It's hard to get people sympathetic about sharks, you know, to support jaws, basically. And then we were able to show with scientific evidence that um, shark fins oftentimes contain high levels of mercury. And that did it. I mean, uh, that plus the pictures of sharks getting thin, people were turned off by that. I think most people don't like cruelty. But also on top of that, you know, if you're ingesting mercury, especially for a, a childbearing woman or anybody, you know, we don't, they can ruin your brain. Uh, that had an impact. Um, so much that we ended up in court being sued by shark fin dealers. But I think in the meantime, we've done all kinds of campaigns and quite frankly, COVID-19 has been the biggest behavior change campaign in terms of impact we've ever seen. And we're seeing a lot less wildlife consumption in China right now. The question is, <clears throat> given what happened after SARS, is that gonna last? Also, uh, the other side of that is that we can change the, the demand side from the consumers that we make better choices. But also the quickest way to affect the change is with policy. Once you put down that policy and implement it well, people will have no choice but to follow. The suppliers will have no choice. And then we'll be left with the, you know, the, the illegal trade. But we get rid of all the other trade that, that's still harmful but still at the moment legal. So similar to what happened with smoking in the Philippines, it was practically when the government declared it illegal, it was practically in less than a month stopped because it's a national policy now and that can affect immediate change compared to uh, a long drawn campaign on behavior change because that will take a lot of work as mentioned by Stephen because you'd need to, to package it very well to a specific uh, commodity and specific audience. But then again, they work hand in hand. There's more than one way to stop a runaway train. So you work on that side and you also work on this side. So hopefully bringing them all together can make it a bit faster and trying to affect the change. But um, Stephen, you were talking about the kind of the network. You've been, you've been campaigning for this for quite a while and visiting markets around the world. In this network, is it, can you disclose like who's at the top of it? Obviously they have all these foot soldiers now, you know, going to the, you know, getting the, dealing with farmers and, and poachers and hunters and everything to get, to get the, the stock, to get the supply. But how high does it go? I mean, this is, you're talking about billions of dollars in trade and are, do they get government protection or, or something? Cause you know, they're, they seem to be still quite strong. Yeah, <clears throat> well, because it is making so much money, uh, organized crime has become attracted to wildlife trade. Didn't start out like that, but most of the cross-border trade in these species, the large mounts, is done in a very sophisticated way. We're not talking about mon pa kettle operations smuggling you know, a few animals in a truck over a border in the nighttime. We're talking about semi-trucks. We're talking about freighters. We're talking about commercial airlines moving tons and tons of, you saw those pangolin scales, elephant tusks, those sea turtles. So that's organized crime that is usually working in cahoots with uh, at least a few officers along the supply chain. So definitely there's corruption, can't happen without it. 
And that's what we're up against. So these animals that are making their way onto the markets, not just in Wuhan, but you know, San Francisco, New York, Bangkok, other places. This is being done in an uncontrolled, oftentimes contaminated way. And it's mixed, legal and illegal. And you've got breeding farms as well. So when you look at the people behind it, the fact that they don't care about other people, they just want to get the product to market, just like they're moving drugs, they've staked out their territory. Um, that's what we really need to take into consideration. They're the ones that are making most of the money they're corrupting the enforcement chain and they're making us sick. Yes, there are legal dealers also. And like I said, unfortunately, I think we need to, that needs to stop as well, but fair is fair, they should be compensated in a one-off by some kind of transition and let's start over, let's push reset. Yeah, well, this is a little off topic, but now that I have you talking about the, you know, the organized crime, has your life ever been threatened? Because you've been going from market to market campaigning about this uh, and come across, have, coming across certain powerful people. Yeah, we, we have a, an extensive team and, you know, I've hired largely folks from the sort of who are good analysts and from former law enforcement agencies who know what they're doing. So I think the people whose lives are really at risk are those who you know, are not putting their face onto a Zoom like me, but others who are out there, we're getting excellent information, watching these supply chains, trying to put them out of business. But I'm here to tell you, uh, it's an uphill battle. And the easiest thing to do, going back to my respected colleague from WWF, he's absolutely right, policy. If we can get high level policy to just shut down this trade, it's not going to happen overnight, but it's going to draw it and it will drive some of the trade underground for sure. But there'll be fewer people willing to take the risk going underground to sell. And there'll be fewer people willing to take the risk to go underground to buy. That reduces the volume of wildlife that reduces the risk of uh, threats to the species and to us. And at the end of the day, it narrows the scope for law enforcement. It makes their job easier. Thanks, thanks, Stephen. Um, corollary to that, I have a question for, I guess, maybe Paolo, because um, it says from Brian Gonzalez, Philippine government issued a 2011 administrative order a zoon for zoonosis interagency cooperation. How do we strengthen this and how can the Philippines shepherd this model in the ASEAN region? I think this administrative order is similar to the other laws that we have. It's just it it suffers from a lack of focus on is it really that important because there's remember that before this uh, current pandemic this was not on the radar of most organizations or especially in government government offices so I think this was this was part of the work of the Bureau of uh, Biodiversity Management Bureau maybe even with the ASEAN uh, the a with ACB but it's not that uh, you could say known so it's not that uh, prioritized because we're here now so we're not focused on this too much but as mentioned earlier that it, it's a matter of putting things into better perspective because when dealing with this uh, with zoonosis we need to bring in several departments for the Philippines specifically to work on this issue and that is a common problem in the country when you have several secretaries working on a specific thing with co-equal powers. So the, the, as we mentioned earlier, the One Health approach in where we, we talk with people, so you probably have the ALG, maybe uh, DOH working there, then you'd have the environment, so you'd have DENR there, and then you'd have also the, for the animals per se, so you'd have the, maybe the, the veterinarian or the agriculture people working together and these are just three departments. So imagine bringing more people into the equation and bringing more people into that body to better work on this. It's been quite a challenge for the Philippines. So several governments have already tried to enact a sort of synergy with all these departments. And we've been working on several of these committees as well, but it's been very problematic in terms of implementing it. So I'm not really sure if this is something that we can move as a model uh, we use as a model moving forward 
maybe in principle as the way it's written, but in terms of implementing it, I believe some other countries may be better at doing it than the Philippines. Because remember that it's not just happening in China. The bats in China that is that was identified as the possible source of the SARS-CoV-2 are the same species that can be found here. The pangolins are one of the highest <clears throat> traffic uh, wildlife in the Philippines in Palawan. We consume alamid coffee as a gourmet thing. It's alamid is the civet cats. These are wildlife that have been tagged as the sources of these zoonotic diseases. And yet, these are things that are very commonly uh, caught and sold in our market because it's not something that we've been focusing on. But maybe as an opportunity now that maybe these are some of the things that we need to look at. It's not just China. There was a question for India. It's not just that. These specific animals, maybe not the camel or MERS, but they are also here and they're very prevalent and they're very uh, big part of the illegal trade. And as well, when we look at the destruction of their habitats, we, we cut down more forests, we expose uh, ourselves to more viruses. So that's also part of the equation. And I think we have a lot of laws concerning that, but it's not very well implemented and monitored. And um, is there a particular country, this is a question from Chiqui Quintos, uh, is there a particular country in the world that could serve as a model for protecting its wildlife and protecting wildlife trade? Is there anyone who's been, you know? That's, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a leader. We're looking for a champion to champion this one health approach. And I think, uh, as I mentioned in the, the, the presentation, there's a few countries in Southeast Asia that actually um, could take a leading role in one way or another. The Philippines, for, first of all, like I said, has laws on its books that would allow the government to dig up all that dirty money made by syndicates that are raping their oceans, chopping down their trees, doing all these illegal things that are destroying nature and making the world dangerous, not just for Filipinos, but for the rest of the world. And, you know, let's find that money. The Philippines should lead the way on what we call restitution. Um, there's other countries in the region, uh, Vietnam and Thailand. Vietnam's prime minister has come out saying he wants to pass a directive to ban the trade in wildlife. We haven't seen it yet, but there's talk about it. Um, Thailand could also has some very good wildlife protection going on on the ground and some people at the higher levels talking about it. So there's a few countries in the region and facilitating some of that discussion in the middle is the ASEAN Interparliamentary Assembly which is all the lawmakers. We briefed them a few weeks ago. Tremendous interest from the lawmakers, which we did not see in the past, and now they're, they're keenly interested in finding out what should they do. And the question that always comes up is, how are they gonna pay for all this? And I think, you know, again, it's merging budgets and the One Health approach, making nature protection your really long-term sustainable vaccine. Paulo, do you wanna add anything to that? I'd just like to stress that, uh, in particular, for our tropical forests, we actually view it as our antivirus. Because if we keep that intact and we keep the animals there, so we'd really stop it, that we'd really reduce the risk of the next pandemic. He even mentioned that we've, we're spending so much to build the virus, to create the vaccine for this one, but it won't work for the next one. So we really have to stop the next one from happening. And we do that by cutting down on illegal wildlife trade and the destruction of our natural habitats. And what about the wildlife trade? Is, is there going to be a legal component of the wildlife trade for, let's say, the medicinal, for medicinal purposes? How, how do you, how do you um, confront um, those with cultural practi uh, practices that believe some animals have certain healing powers, like you know, some Asian countries, and that's where part of the trade, you know, is from like something about the pangolin scales as well, right? Are supposed to have some medicinal properties. So how do you how how do you deal with cultural beliefs as well? A very tiny percentage of traditional Chinese medicine is based on wildlife. Most of it is based on herbs. So that's a, it's a misconception. But you're right, it does exist, and it only takes a tiny percentage of countries with 1.6 billion people 
to drive a lot of trade and therefore poaching and trade. Um, I think that the, the key here is that just to remind people that um, this stuff, you know, the science isn't really there to support it making you better. And there's a pandemic that just happened that suggests it might make you sick. Additionally, uh, we have to respect different cultures and in making uh, policies that affect their lives so that sometimes uh, there are some, some laws that actually take these into consideration. For, uh, for example, uh, in general, sea turtles are not supposed to be traded, but there are some exemptions to some communities that have been practicing the, the eating of these sea turtles as part of their culture so that they're still allowed to do that but in a scale that is not as destructive as the other methods mentioned that you don't hunt them for to get 18,000 pangolins to dip, to get the the shells the scales and then sell it to china so this is more for low similarly uh, as mentioned by steven we're not saying that we cannot we're, we're telling the natives not to hunt for bush meat for example because that's something that they they need as a source of protein, but we also need to better educate some of the communities about the risk. Like uh, as mentioned by Stephen, mercury poisoning is a very big risk for fish or any marine animal larger than 40 kilos. So if the meat will definitely have a lot of mercury, similar to big, let's say big tuna. So it's it has to always respect the cultures but in a way we'd have to work with it as well so that their culture and our culture will, will form sort of a synthesis on how to work together to avoid the next pandemics. Thanks, Paolo. Um, I noticed also, I have a question from uh, one of the attendees that you had, when you had your map earlier, Stephen, you, there was a lot of red dot all over India. So what is India's role in all of this as a transit hub and an origin perhaps? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so India's got good wildlife protection policies, pretty straightforward. Um, there are species that are being taken out of India, of course, uh, and are being poached. But I, I think the, um, the reason for the spread of COVID there is not linked to the wildlife trade. Um, you know, it's, there were infections and they, you know, there's a lot of people there, so it's hard to control it. Um, my wife's from India, so I, I hear about this. It's a little more complicated than that. But the good thing about India is you don't see wildlife markets all over the place. So it's a it's a it's a different it's a different issue there. And um, Brian Gonzalez made a comment. Let me just read it out. The Philippines is a supplier of monkeys for animal testing, so that's legal, right? Mm -hmm. Now, there was Ebola reston virus was discovered from a monkey facility in Laguna a few years ago. Would you like to say anything about that? How did it get here and well, was it uh, the, we only have one species of monkey in the Philippines, the long-tailed macaque. So if this is the same thing that uh, similar to a species in, in Africa with the source of the Ebola, it may in a, a logically also carry a similar virus. It may not be the exact Ebola virus that, uh, that struck uh, Africa a few years ago. But still, the main component is there. The monkeys have a virus that they've, been have, they've sort of evolved to become immune to it. And then because we keep catching them and breeding them in small spaces and then coming into contact with them, so eventually these viruses would then, can then mutate and become pathogenic to humans. So I think it's still Ebola because it similarly looks like the one in, in Africa, but it may be a different type of Ebola and another strain of Ebola. But the same way we named the SARS-CoV-2 a SARS-CoV-2 because it looked very similar to the first SARS. So maybe that's the naming convention. But then again, it might not be as as infectious or as fatal as the one in Africa. But, okay, I just going earlier when you were talking about, now you're talking about like Ebola was also another incidence of you, animal to human trans, zoonotic transmission, right? How, yes. like, 
how is that trans it's not necessarily through a bite right that a human uh, an animal infects a human how, what are the ways a human can be infected it's, uh, you want to see, see that? Go ahead. Go ahead. So ways to get infected, but essentially it you need to have contact with it, and it doesn't have to be in contact with the animal per se, because even the wastes of the animals, the secretions, can also bring the disease. So essentially, coming into contact with the animals per se and their environment can lead us to getting the disease because the pathogens can be carried directly either from their let's say their saliva. So when they bite you, like rabies, or when they uh, when we uh, come in contact with their, let's say, urine or feces mm -hmm. or other secretions in their body, which may affect uh, us eventually. So it doesn't have to be because of we get bitten by something or we eat something. It's generally coming into contact with any part or waste of the animals that may carry these uh, pathogens that can be transferred due, because of spillover to, to humans. So it's not just about getting bitten by a dog or a bat. It can transfer in several ways. And not just from a wild animal to humans. It can also happen between wild animals to domestic, domesticated animals. And the way we farm our domesticated animals in very tight uh, areas, very uh, dense populations, it's it's the breed it's a perfect breeding ground for anything that spills over to them and eventually may spill over to us becoming pathogenic absolutely yeah i think that's a really important thing to add to this it's not just the wildlife trade like we said before the destruction of the habitat largely for industrial intensive farming there's better ways to do farming using that agroforestry expertise you know and a compassionate sustainable approach uh, indigenous populations, the way they live and collect animals, there's not problems there. It's just this large intensive approach that we need to really rethink. And remembering that, you know, it just takes a few people to get sick, to get it from the pig or from the wild animal directly. Like in China, we don't know exactly yet how many people actually got infected to begin with. But, you know, when you asked about India before, probably people who are studying or working in a different country, they got it from people. People are the biggest transmitters once the whole thing starts. Because of the improvements in our transportation. Right. We used to be very isolated, but with the air, the airline industry, it just spreads. And, and now it's supposed to be airborne, right? So that makes it, I mean, the latest news, right? Through air, aerosols and all that so yeah yeah you can yeah. get it talking to each other yeah yeah okay now in your experience here's another question for to both of you have you come across indigenous communities or tribes that act as protectors or saviors of certain wildlife species yes but they are having a harder time doing it because they're coming up against commercial armed poaching gangs who are coming into their territory who are being sponsored by, you know, traffickers, commercial traffickers. But yes, historically, uh, in different parts of the world, indigenous groups have done a lot to protect not just the wild animals, but the habitat. And the way they live is, you know, it's sustainable. Um, but again, when you've got folks coming in to a plot of land, say in Brazil, and they want to take it over to have cows for the beef industry. They clear a lot of the forest. They push the indigenous people further in. And, you know, that can also kill the indigenous people. Um, they may be exposed to new viruses themselves. And suddenly you've got exotic birds and jaguars and people who are at risk, all because we, you know, the world wants lots and lots of cows for, for hamburgers and McDonald's. In the Philippines, we, we work with uh, several communities that do uh, protect the, the wildlife. In particular, maybe I'd like to highlight the ones in Mindoro, the, the Tagabuid tribe that we've been working with in Mindoro. They specifically work to preserve the tamaraos in Mindoro. I think I remember the story when we started going there that 
when our team got to the village, we had to ask permission from the village if we can enter the village. But then they say, said that they had to consult with their elder spirits first before they allow us to go there. Because if I remember correctly, they they think they believe that the 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 animal the tamarals uh, are also part of the spirit world where their their ancestors are now uh, living so that everything in nature is connected for them it's a very different outlook for many people but then again because it's part of their world the spiritual world for them they really work hard in trying to conserve and preserve the tamaraos in Mindoro uh, okay there's another question a follow-up to that what is the possibility of capitalizing on myths to protect wild animals, just the same, just the same way as myths about healing properties and curing impotence are driving demand for consumption. So that's they they may have it. worked, yeah. They may have worked a lot in the past. Remember a lot of stories that you don't go into that forest because there's a bantai or guardian. You don't go swimming in that because there's something there. There's a spirit. But I think with but, with the information. <laughs> In, in, in information, in information uh, the a lot of these lot of are these getting debunked but in a communication sort of way we can still work uh, we can still capitalize on that but not to the point that we're spreading false news and i've seen uh, i'm afraid that organized crime as strong as it is is going to cut through that myth and go after the animal anyway an example of that last year, we were investigating a tiger trafficking syndicate in Southeast Asia. And long story short, when they caught the, um, the middlemen, they, we got their phones and on their phones, they were text messaging back and forth to the poachers who they'd given the money to, to go kill the tigers. And those poachers were sending back pictures actually um, hunched over the tiger, the dead tiger in the forest in a mythological way showing themselves as this sort of Chinese god that, you know, um, with, with the tiger, okay. there's actually a statue that shows that. So um, I think, you know, okay. the money's so big that they're gonna, they're gonna cut through the myth and do it anyway. But, um, okay, so let's go back to pol the politics of it all and policy. So, um, Paul, I don't know in the Philippines has any, has perhaps a wildlife group or an indigenous group or, or you know, an, an NGO actually filed some kind of case against poachers or, you know, in, in, with the um, goal of preservation of wildlife or preservation of habitat. Has that ever happened? And have, how are judges and prosecutors, how do they regard these um, wildlife crimes? There have been some high, high level, uh cases where, for example, uh, a poor farmer shot a Philippine eagle. And I think he was penal uh, fined or maybe, I'm not sure if he was sent to jail. But these are the, rather the, not the ones that we really want to go after. Because these are not really the ones that are affecting it largely. But the Philippine eagle is uh, it's a very small population. So even just one is, is very significant. But then again, I remember a, a story from Attorney Jerti Mayo Anda from Palawan saying that since the inception of, let's say, for in particular, the, the, the laws for the Republic Act 8550 or the Fisheries Code of the Philippines, that there, there are several, a lot of illegal activities there that can be penalized. But then again, for several years, not a single one has been, uh, uh, you say, None of them were guilty in the long run. It's partly because the these new laws are special laws. So I, if I understand it correctly, the Philippines recently also created a sort of green court. These are the ones where the judges are specializing on, on cases in, uh, with an environmental impact. Uh, but I'm not sure about the implementation of this court of this special courts because uh, I haven't heard of any uh, ruling where the somebody was penalized for it except for the Chinese 
vessel that hit uh, that was caught in was it uh, they were they hit uh, ground in in Tubataha, and then they found a lot of pangolins on board. Oh yeah. So that that was the first case that the culprits were had the verdict saying that it's that they're guilty. Not sure what happened. I think DFA intervened later on, but then again, that was I think one of the major cases where somebody was prosecuted effectively because of these wildlife cases. And Stephen, are there prosecutions as well in other parts of, of the world? Have you come across? You, you mentioned a few of them, right? But Oh, sure. Um, you know, the rate of prosecutions globally, it's not very high because the courts, you know, may not take this crime. And I'm speaking generally now as seriously as others. Prosecutors sometimes won't even take the cases. But there are instances where prosecutors are personally interested. The judges are also sympathetic. <clears throat> we just need that to be more the norm than the exception. Um, and I think uh, I, at the end of the day, though, the thing that's really going to slow this down, stop it, and even help us uh, reverse this destruction and help nature recover is by going after their money. We should be making traffickers finance nature recovery. And that's what the courts can do as well. That doesn't even require criminal prosecution. That's a, that's a civil law. That's, that's money laundering. They're all money laundering. Mm -hmm. Have they been tracked as the money? Have there been successful traces of where the money has been spent? There's been a few, uh, not too many, but it's a it's an emerging trend, and it's one that we'd like to see expand. Um, we've seen a couple cases where uh, here in Thailand we helped the anti money lending authorities uh, track down a syndicate that was trafficking uh, big cats and rosewood and other things, and they found like thirty seven million dollars worth of assets. Uh, nobody would have thought, looking at this particular family, that they would have had that much money, but they had an enormous amount of money. They froze those assets. None of that money went into nature protection because their laws did not allow for it. So we're trying to revise that now. Uh, we've also seen cases where a few different countries, I can't speak about which ones, these are ongoing things, are actually collaborating now, going after wildlife traffickers. And the first thing that the anti-money laundering investigators do is they divvy up the pie. They say, okay, let's break the supply chain, find who's a, who the kingpins, get the money, and when we happen, it's 50-50. 50% of their assets go to each of our country. Some of that money should be going back into nature recovery, and then we can all get part of this game. We can turn it into a, a Robin Hood. Yeah, but doesn't it sound a little bit hypocritical as well? They're, you know, they're contributing to the destruction of the environment and, and you know, um, furthering the wildlife trade. But then if they put money back into it, they'll be okay. I mean, ideally, it would be the best thing to do would be to stop them, right, completely and seize all their assets, maybe. And, you know, I think you you do stop them by taking all their money. You freeze the trigger. You basically emptied their fuel tank and filled ours. Mm -hmm. That's the poetic justice, and that's really what's going to have the impact. And yeah, I'd also like to add that some some of the you could say the capture of wildlife are are sometimes not intentional. Okay, we I don't think that many people in the Philippines, at least, go around hunting for dolphins or or mm -hmm. sea turtles, but because of the other practices that we've been doing, particularly for catching, let's say, tuna, these are bycatches of the process of catching the other species. So, but in turn, when they catch, let's say, the dolphin or the, the shark, unintentionally, by the way, or the sea turtles in their nets or in their lines, they still trade them. So, they, it's, it's, still, it's still a part of that trading system that sometimes technology can play a big role in trying to stop that part of the capture of these wildlife. So I think we worked on with some tuna fishers before where we promoted the use of a circular hook instead of a J hook because the circular hook made it more difficult for the turtles to get stuck compared to the mm -hmm. J hook which would easily get them stuck. So 
So that the by simply changing that particular hook, it minimized the bycatch of sea turtles from the tuna fishing. And one of the points I was trying to make before Bambina was, um, you know, a lot of times the people who get caught and go to court, who are handcuffed, maybe spend some time in jail, they're really low on the totem pole. And the way to find out who's really orchestrating this is to follow the money and take their money. So even if the conviction and prosecution rates go up, a lot of the times the trade continues because we haven't found the uh, financial trigger. And that's what I'm saying we have to stop. Yeah, that's a lot of sleuthing work, right? Involved yes. as well. But they yeah. think yeah. What, what Steven is saying that I think the Philippines may be positioned to do something about it, particularly with the AMLA law. Because mm -hmm. remember that the, the law, the AMLA law, specifically triggers when large amounts of money are transferred. Mm -hmm. So that uh, I think uh, not every country has that mechanism to, to track that and freeze it if needed. So that it may be something that we could look into as a, as a policy moving forward is to try to use the AMLA, the council, to help us track these, these these transfers of big amounts of money. Because remember, the Philippines has been not just tagged as a source of, let's say, the pangolin or other species, but some have also been tagged as the buyers. I think we were also on the radar for ivory trafficking a few years back. So that we are one of the major buyers of tusk, ivory tusk. So maybe the, the AMLA can be used, as mentioned by Stephen, to help us with tracking where's the money, where does the money go? So, I mean, we, have, we kind of have the infrastructure in place. It's just a matter of enforcement and I guess political will as well, no? That's right. I yes. think traditionally these issues have been put on the desk of you know, wildlife authorities and ministries of environment. I know the officers in the Philippines have been working very hard on these issues for years, but it's not always easy to get the ear of the president or the Congress and others who really ultimately make the budgets and the policies. And now I think is the time to do it. It's to show, look, we're not just protecting wildlife, we're protecting people here. Yeah, especially with the, the impact of, uh, of COVID-19, right? I mean, all the more reason to focus on, on, on this matter. But can we, would you be able to give like um, just concrete everyday, like what the ordinary person can do now? I mean, a lot of it, we've talked about policy and, and you know, protecting the planet and all that, which means a coordinated effort from various stakeholders and governments. And But like, would it mean for, for an ordinary person to switch to a plant-based diet, for example, or minimize the consumption of meat, mm -hmm. or maybe less urban development, I don't know. I mean, obviously you have to balance the economy and you know, all sorts of other factors and, and public health. So practically speaking, how, how could we do it? You know? Paula, you wanna go first or? Go ahead. Okay, well, I mean, the, you know, really the biggest impact is going to be policy, but what people can do is demand uh, a change in policy. You know, they say you're, you're chasing vaccines, but what about nature protection? We heard that this was all about destruction of nature. You know, let's, let's get away from these silly stories of diversions of, you know, like you said in the beginning of a conspiracy or, you know, leaks from a lab, et cetera. <laughs> We've had pandemics before. They're gonna happen again until we address the root causes. So demand your governments to be spending more on nature protection. This is not just about picnics anymore, this is national security. Secondly, yes, be a wiser, con more compassionate consumer. Going to a plant-based diet would solve a lot of problems. If you're not ready to do that, then at least be a, a conscientious shopper and try to buy food that comes from, you know, that's organic, free range, the kind of agriculture that allows, like you showed in your picture before, Paolo, uh, coexist with trees and nature, etc. that's less likely to be harmful to the animals and less likely to pass pathogens. These are two simple things that you can do, and I'm sure Paolo can add um, more ideas. 
So we can also help support activities that help protect and restore natural habitat. So I know that this has become uh, very common in the Philippines now, but we, we like to join tree planting activities. A lot of groups have been conducting, we've been doing this for quite some time. But we must remember that tree planting is a one day activity. There are 364 days left in the year that we have to take care and ensure that the tree grows. It's, a, it's more like tree growing and not tree planting because tree planting is for the pictures. Tree growing is to ensure that it becomes a forest. Also, we also have to minimize our footprint, the way we consume the environment. So the target for WW is actually to half the human footprint and by changing our consumption patterns, it may be shifting to a more plant-based diet. I know that's difficult, it's very difficult, but also changing the way we consume things like let's consume, let's uh, be more uh, informed about our choices in let's say packaging. We have a very big campaign against plastics in nature, not plastics in general, but rather plastics in nature, in our seas, in our ocean, in our food. And also because we have to also ensure that we safeguard the diversity of life. And part of doing this is that we have to be better, uh, we have to be better informed about a lot of things. Why is it that we are saying that this one species is very important for life on earth, for example? Uh, it's just a species, it's just a butterfly, it's just an ant, it's just a horseshoe crab. But then again, all of these are intertwined. And as, as I mentioned earlier with the horseshoe crab, Believe it or not, without that horseshoe crab, we'd be dealing with a lot, a lot more problems with our vaccines and anything that we put in our bodies because the, the horseshoe crab is the only source of that chemical that can check for toxins in, in these medicines. So imagine if we don't have that and then we have this COVID now. So we'd be left with practically almost nothing to stop it from happening, from, the, from killing ourselves with the medicine that we're putting into our bodies. So it's, it's a lot of other things that we need to, to take care of because each and every uh, thing in the environment plays a role. Everything is connected and that we really need to have a larger support, particularly from policy, because it's very difficult to convince 8 billion people, 7 billion people around the world. It's very difficult to convince 12 million people in Metro Manila. Can you just simply turn off the faucet when you lather your hands with soap. It's 20 seconds of washing your hands with soap and the faucet running. That's about 1.5 to 2 liters of water for that 20 seconds alone. So these are some of the things that you have to better understand as consumers so that we can have that uh, smaller footprint while also increasing biodiversity, which is the backbone of the One Health uh, approach to help stop that next pandemic. And also just one very simple thing, don't buy or sell wild animals. Whether it's for food, medicine, trophies, whatever, just stay away from commercial trade. Leave them in their natural homes. Respect Respectable social distance with wildlife. Go look at them, enjoy them. Don't buy them or touch them. In fact, we have laws about that. We can't even gather coral, dead corals or shells in the sea, technically, because they're part of the environment. So don't do that. Yeah, I've heard that in Cebu, especially, you're not allowed to take um, corals or maktan stone even, or something like that, yeah. right? Because um, it's part okay. of the environment, the ecosystem. Yeah. I think this has been really great, very eye-opening. Um, the extent of the trade was just, staggering actually but it's also good to know that all's not lost that there's things we can do to to um to contribute to planet the health of the planet which includes animal life and human life and, and environmental life um before we close um wanted to ask if you had any last words and just to let everyone know that we have um a recording we're recording this now and it will be up in our youtube the manila house um youtube channel in, um, in a couple of days, in a day or so, it should be up already. Um, would you like to say some final words before we close? Just um, in our case, uh, any other information you want, go to our website, a campaign website called npandemics.earth. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Similarly, yeah, you can visit yeah. our webpage www.org.ph or you can also visit our social media pages on Facebook and Twitter www.philippines and you could see our updates on everything that we do here and in particular uh, I think you can also find a lot of the reports uh, the, the, I used for this presentation so if you want the, the complete report you can also find it there. Sure. Okay. Thank you so much to our two speakers today, Stephen Galster and Paolo Pagaduan. This is a wonderful afternoon. Um, and thank you for all that information. And like I said, it, it was really eye opening. And I, I see from the comments that a lot of attendees have the same, um, have the same um, feedback. And um, I just wanted to say that next week we have another webinar on Tuesday, 3 p.m. Uh, about libel. So this is obviously moving away from pandemics. We're, we're talking about libel and the law and we have um, Chief Justice Antonio Carpio joining us as, as well as attorney um, Geronimo C and Marites Vito, who is a seasoned journalist. So we hope you'll join us for that as well. Thank you so much, everybody. On behalf of Manila House, I'd like to thank our two speakers today, Stephen and Paolo, and thank you to all our attendees for tuning in. And be kind to the planet. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>